Canada's parliament celebrated an actual Nazi. What is happening in that part of the world? Japan, South Korea and China are conducting discussions to bring some normalcy in a region which has seen a spike in tensions recently. What were the conclusions of this discussion? This is the Daily Debrief. These are your stories for the day. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please hit that subscribe button. Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has called the incident deeply embarrassing. The Speaker of the country's parliament has apologised. This is after a 92-year-old Ukrainian man who was in a Nazi military unit was honoured in the Canadian parliament and received a standing ovation. The incident took place in the presence of Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky. 98-year-old Yaroslav Hunka, who was hailed as a Ukrainian hero, a Canadian hero, was thanked for his service. He had served in a unit made up of Ukrainians who fought alongside the Nazis against the Soviet army during the Second World War. We go to Prabir Purkayasa to analyze this, this decidedly weird incident. Uh, thanks Prabir so much for joining us. So very rarely do we speak about uh, what is what could be considered maybe a bit of a faux pas, but definitely this is, I think it's more than a faux pas. There are larger political dimensions at play because you have an actual Nazi being honored by the Canadian parliament after that, of course, Trudeau calling it an embarrassment, everyone's, uh, you know, uh, calling it a horrendous mistake, etc., etc., calling it a one-off incident. But also, in some senses, reflects, I think, a political sort of tendency or trend that has been going on since the Ukrainian war has started. This is a very strange issue because the person concerned is 98 years old, okay, but he was supposed to have fought against the Russians in 1940s. The obvious question for anybody with a modicum of history would know that the only war at the time was that was going on against Nazi Germany. And Russia at the time was Soviet Union. It wasn't Russia. And Ukraine was a part of Soviet Union. This is, this is something which people would have known with a really a modicum of Jeb GK. So how is it the entire secretariat of the parliament and the Speaker of the Parliament, both seem to have been completely ignorant of history. How is it their history has been so now molded by the current scenario where Ukraine is seen to be fighting Russia and therefore thinking this is a much older battle and Ukraine was fighting for independence against Russia, which seems to have been the, uh, shall we say, the underlying theme that was being presented when Mr. Unka was presented with this uh, medal of honor, so to say. So it, it does seem not only a very shoddy exercise, but a complete ignorance of the history of Second World War, history of Ukraine, history of uh, Soviet Union and Russia, that could have led to a mistake like this. And particularly, it just takes about a minute to know that the so-called Galician uh, unit that was being referred to was nothing but a part of the SS Nazi Germany's military wing. So it, it is something which is uh, elementary, I would say, in terms of historical knowledge. So how could they do this is the question. I think the argument here or the uh, what I think is happening that the Ukrainian versus Russia theme has so become so, become so dominant and this is something, the agenda which has been pushed. The history of the Bandarite section in Ukraine, the alliance between the section of those who were Stephen Bandera's followers and the Nazi Germany alliance is totally airbrushed out of history, if not forgotten in real terms. Now, this is not only something the group not only fought against Soviet Union, which is what they did as a part of the German army, but they were also involved in a number of atrocities, both against Polish population, against their own population, and of course, against the Jewish population. Again, very well documented. All of this is known. And I think somebody, a historian, who pulled all these facts out within a very short period and put it on the internet 
in what is now called X, but what we knew as Twitter. And that created immediately a backlash that how could Ukraine, uh, how could somebody claiming to be Ukraine fight freedom fighter who's actually a part of the SS Galician uh, unit, how could some in Canada such a person be not only fettered, but, you know, hand claps with Zelensky there, Trudeau being there, all of it. How could such an embarrassment take place? And I said, it's really ignorance of history, ignorance of their uh, the past, and not knowing much about Ukraine or Soviet Union or Russia or about Europe, which they, some of them at least claimed to have come from. All of this is really, I think, a part of what we see. And a quick attempt to make hay, uh, win some cheap uh, kudos by honoring a Ukrainian who fought, fought in the 40s for uh, independence of Ukraine against Russia, forgetting what was the actual history of that era. Uh, Premier, also, of course, ignoring the uh, hundreds of thousands, if not more, of Ukrainians who were in the Soviet army fighting against the Nazis as well. But you made a very interesting point, which is that this is also a sign of the times, which is why we're discussing this today as well, where, for instance, the person concerned was uh, declared as an Ukrainian hero and a Canadian hero, and that is how he was feted. So, also, this is attempt to sort of link the... Uh, you know, the, the Ukrainian people and the Canadian people, you have seen this in many other, many other countries in the West as well, portraying this war. Trudeau has made similar speeches, portraying this war somehow as a frontier of the fight for democracy, for freedom, against authoritarianism, etc. And this incident, for instance, very neatly fits into that kind of a, a narrative that's be, that is domestically being, they're, they're trying to do it in the West. You know, this part of what you're talking about, of course, is the rewriting of history. Uh, that is one part of it. But also it's very important to understand who are rewriting this history. And a lot of this, and this is not dissimilar to what's happening again in, for India as well, you have the emigre population who go abroad, who migrate to countries like Canada, like United States, try to become a part of the politics of those countries then push the politics of those countries for your agenda, which really predate your migration. In this case, you have the Ukrainian agenda, the so-called Ukrainian nationalists who were co-opted by the United States post the Second World War, who had actually cooperated with Nazi Germany. In fact, Nazi Germany uh, supporters in Eastern Europe were taken over essentially by the United States for two reasons. One is to operate as a fifth column against the Soviet Union because a lot of them either become socialists, join the socialist bloc, or were a part of Soviet Union itself. Because if you remember, Nazi Germany had penetrated inside Soviet Union, particularly in the Ukraine uh, area. So this is one part of it. The second part of it is that it fitted in very well in the larger agenda that the United States had which is the battle against uh, Soviet Union. And if you have people who have come from these areas, then the ability to raise fifth columnists at home in these areas, and therefore the emigre population were actually taken to their bosom, so to say, and used for this kind of uh, activities. And one of the issues was to how to whitewash them. For instance, in Canada, I think 2,000 <clears throat> of those who were in the SS Galician uh, forces actually were taken to Canada. Similarly, a large number of them migrated to the United States. And then they were whitewashed over a period of time and presented as nationalists, not because the United States didn't know who they were, but all of these were essentially thought to be people who could be used against the uh, Soviet Union and led the socialist bloc. And let's not forget, you had the intelligence chief of Germany who defected with his whole intelligence apparatus, convinced the, uh, convinced the Americans particularly that he had a lot to offer. It's not very different from what the Japanese, for instance, did. There is an important 
group which involved itself with experiments against uh, the use of biological and chemical we weapons against the, for instance, the Chinese soldiers and, of course, North Koreans, who were again taken over lock, stock and barrel by the United States. And they became the core of what the United States then uh, their attempts at chemical and biological weapons would become. So all of this history is, is very murky. And the U.S., of course, has been a major player in all of this. But what we now see that Canada is also a player in this. And let's not forget, for instance, the, uh, the Punjab uh, divisive movements that existed, what is called in India, the Halistani movement to try and create an independent state of Punjab, which has no traction in India at the moment, but it seems to have traction amongst the Canadian emigre population from Punjab. So these are things which the Canadian state has been using these internal elements in their external foreign policy. And whether it is Ukraine, whether it's in India, the Canadian objective seems to be very similar. How can they align? How can these groups be aligned with our foreign policy objectives is the, really the issue. And in this case, of course, it is clear that the issue is Ukraine versus Russia and how, therefore, to co-opt the fascist forces, which, of course, also exist in the Ukrainian military, how to co-opt them as a part of the larger agenda of the NATO countries. Canada, unfortunately, along with the United States, is home to many, many of the same groups. And a lot of the politics that plays out in the West plays out in the interest of the small immigrant populations because they act really as small, what shall we say, ginger groups trying to change their policy of the countries which they have emigrated to. And quite often that between the intelligence agencies and these groups, there is a meeting of minds, which is what seems to have happened in this case as well, except it became highly embarrassing that the way it sort of blew up in their face. All right, Prabir, thank you so much for that analysis. Definitely more than meets the eye there. And I think uh, it would be a mistake to dismiss this as just a four power or one-off embarrassment, which is what the Canadians are now desperately trying to do. We'll be following this. Thank you so much. Diplomats from China, South Korea and Japan met to try and ease tensions in the region. After the summit, it was announced that there would be a meeting of their leaders and there would be an attempt to get them all together to meet soon. This is a tough time for the region as a whole. Both Japan and South Korea have right-wing governments which are moving closer to each other and the United States. In fact, President Joe Biden recently hosted the leaders of these two countries in Camp David. We go to Anish to get a sense of the meeting. Anish, thank you so much for joining us. It's been, uh, this is a region we have discussed a lot in recent times in episodes of Daily Dispatch, especially uh, the increasing meeting of minds, so to speak, between the US, Japan and South Korea. So this is a meeting with a difference. We have Japan, South Korea and China having a discussion. So could you maybe take us through what was on the agenda? What was the context of the meeting, for instance? Well, let's begin with the fact that this is uh, this was supposed to be a routine meeting. Uh, it began in 2008 and it has happened almost on a periodical basis uh, since then until 2019 when uh, because of uh, the war reparations and uh, colonialism reparations uh, dispute emerged between uh, South, South Korea and Japan. And, uh, and we have talked about the forced labor dispute as well, uh, with Japan kind of uh, is yet to uh, consider to be uh, valid uh, or you know pay compensation for it. But nevertheless, that uh, was completely swept under under the rug recently, and there has been some what many of the mainstream media calls a thawing between uh, South Korea and Japan, but you know it never was frozen to begin with. Uh, but uh, what we see right now is a very different kind of context because while newspaper and uh, news media houses have been talking about how it is significant for South Korea and Japan to hold this meeting or South Korea to hold, host the meeting to begin with, uh, the significance is the fact that, as you said, China is involved and China is back on uh, back on the table in a trilateral uh, you know, discussion and diplomatic connections with, uh, with the three countries. And that is significant uh, in, just in and of itself. We do not see much significance in the agenda of the meeting. 
Uh, we do not know, there is no surety uh, if there will be a, a meeting of the leaders, uh, possibly presidents uh, and prime ministers of the country uh, in the near future. But this is definitely one step forward. Uh, but how many steps backward is a different question because we have already spoken about how South Korea and Japan have taken to a very uh, sort of belligerent position when it comes to China, especially when it comes to Taiwan and uh, them involving themselves into other disputes that they do not have any stakes in, especially in South China Sea, with Japan having, uh, you know, tie, uh, make, uh, is making ties with the uh, Philippines. Uh, you know, even pushing for a, a, a very pro, a militaristic uh, sort of uh, arrangement that can have actually have Japanese uh, bases in the region. So all of these factors are definitely going to be uh, at the forefront. China is definitely raising these issues, especially with Taiwan. It's a very, you know, it's pretty much the red line for China in most cases. And the fact that both these countries have taken very questionable stand on this is something that is going to be a matter of concern for the coming meetings, if there are going to be, to begin with. Right, Anish, but also we are talking, looking at a time when there has been, uh, of course, some discussion about further US-China engagement as well. We've seen various visits by ministers. Uh, there are talks of, at least pre-talks of Biden and Xi Jinping maybe having a meeting as well. So uh, do how do we see this, uh, you know, this meeting in the context of that larger trend? Is it more of a uh, can we even call it a trend at this point of time or is, are these just individual instances whereas the larger trend is towards escalation? Well, there is a trend, but it's a very confused trend. Let's be, <laughs> we have to be very honest about it. Uh, China is quite wary of uh, these diplomatic overtures. It is definitely open to uh, talks and uh, you know, diplomacy with all of these countries uh, to deal with pretty much all kind of uh, disputes, whatever they be. Uh, but what we have seen, and if you refer to some of Chinese media uh, uh, reports, you actually see a great deal of uh, wariness, not just from the government, but also from its intelligentsia, its civil society, even its uh, media houses. Uh, and that clearly shows how, they, and that is primarily has to do with the fact that they have, all of these countries have uh, reviewed some of their earlier commitments. Uh, they have, uh, you know, crossed some of the lines. They have provoked China, uh, especially when we look at, you know, expansion of the Thaad missiles uh, systems, for instance, by South Korea, or the fact that Japan uh, is moving towards militarizing itself uh, in the next couple of years, eschewing its pacifist constitution. And all of these factors are definitely going to be a matter of concern for China. And of course, we have to talk about the Fukushima waters as well. So all of these uh, aside, China is definitely open to diplomacy. And that is pretty much why these meetings are happening. But we do not see uh, the same level of enthusiasm from the Chinese side as it used to happen earlier, when you would have you know, very high level meetings happening uh, on matters of disputes. But right now, what we're seeing is uh, second or third rung leaders and diplomats uh, running these meetings, leading these meetings, and not necessarily uh, people with actual power on you know, foreign policy or you know, national security. So this is uh, a very, you know, we have to be very careful of how we look at this. As I said, the meeting in, it, in and of itself is significant. And the fact that it kind of opens up uh, you know, a trilateral forum for these three countries to resolve their disputes and their contentions. But uh, what it will achieve is a different question. And it pretty much, uh, you know, remains on what uh, action South Korea and Japan will take in the coming months. Well, Anish, thank you so much for that update. Like you said, it's a very, uh, you know, a region which is actually going through a lot at this point of time. We also, of course, recently saw North Korean leader Kim Jong-un's visit to Russia, that's probably on the minds of Japan and South Korea as well. Uh, and, you know, the, the possibility of, uh, say, escalation is on everyone's minds, matter of concern. Thank you so much for talking to us. And that's all we have time for in this episode of Daily Debrief. We'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Until then, go to our website, peoplesdispatch.org. Follow us on all the social media platforms. And if you're watching this on YouTube, do hit the subscribe button.